Hello and welcome to the NATO Public Forum YouTube studio. I'm Jack Kelly from TLDR News and I'm joined by Admiral Rob Bauer, the chair of the Military Committee of NATO. Hello. Very, very nice to meet you. Thanks for joining nice us. Nice to meet you, Jack. I'm going to dive straight into Ukraine, which is obviously the big topic being discussed both here and around the world. Um, just last week, you warned about underestimating Russia's ability to bounce back in the war and more generally. How do you think NATO's new plans help to protect against the continued threat of Russian aggression? The plans are basically based on the Russian threat and the threat from terror groups. So we are in a very good position with these plans, but it's not only about the plans. We need now, the nations need now, to do what is necessary to make those plans work. So this is about executability of the plans, uh, because if you are looking at collective defense, it's basically the, the timelines is, is based on the enemy. So if someone attacks you, you have to be ready. There's no, there's not a lot of time if you are attacked and when you are attacked. So that is why it is so important to have more forces at a higher readiness level that we are going to really buy the capabilities that we need, mm -hmm. air defense systems or whatever is that is part of the package of uh, capabilities that we need to successfully deter and defend against those two threats. So it is now, it's great to have the plans, which is very historic. Yeah. Uh, and it's an enormous uh, amount of work to, to get there. Um, but it is now time to make them executable. And part of that obviously is involving kind of spending targets around the world. Um, NATO members collectively increased their defence spending by 8.3% in real terms last year, um, which is a record level of spending. Um, but there are some NATO members that are still below the 2% target. Do you think that NATO is doing enough to guarantee security for the future? And is there anything more that could be done there? So the good news is that since 2014, when the first discussion was on the Defence Investment Pledge, uh, the, the, the decision in Wales then was we're going to move towards 2% yes. and then 20% of the defence budget invested in capabilities mm -hmm. um, and no more lower budgets in absolute terms. And I think that has been a success in a way that uh, uh, NATO has seen a huge increase in uh, the, uh, the, the defence budgets across the board. Some are moving faster than others. Uh, and I think part of the discussion here in Vilnius will be what is the new defense investment pledge? Is 2% the ceiling or is it the floor? And I think we are moving towards 2% as a floor. And that then helps us to actually uh, have the money available for all these investments that are necessary. So I think the decision that will be taken in the coming, in the coming days uh, are very important again because they basically assure that there is sufficient money to, to, to do the things that are necessary. Mm -hmm. But we cannot do it alone, because uh, there's another factor that is very important, and that is the defense production capacity. So the defense industries <coughs> in, uh, let's say, Europe and uh, North America. And, uh, and we've seen, again, uh, with a war, as we saw with the pandemic, that just in time, just enough, which has been driving our economies for, for decades, is actually too late and, and not enough. Mm -hmm. And therefore, uh, we need to ramp up the production capacity, but it is uh, a, private, uh, it's a private sector. So we need to talk to financers. We need to convince people to really invest more in defense industry so that the, the armed forces get the capabilities faster when they order them. And mm -hmm. I think that is, the, that, is, that, is, that is parallel to all the things we do in NATO. We need to work on that as well. Absolutely. Um, we obviously heard massive news yesterday that um, Turkey's President Erdogan would be ready to ratify Sweden's accession into NATO. I'm interested on your perspective of what Sweden will add to, the, uh, to NATO's collective security. Well, the good news for all of us is that with the accession of Finland and Sweden, of course, we have more territory to defend, mm -hmm. which is a concern, might yes. be a concern to some. But the good news is they bring very capable forces. To, to help us and to help themselves and to help us as a collective. So uh, I think we are in a very good position with those two nations because they have very modern armed forces, uh, because they were working with us already for a long time. So the integration in military terms in our armed force, in, in the structures, in the military structures, is going to be very easy. Mm -hmm. 
uh, as we now see with Finland already. Yes. Uh, and militarily, there's, a, there's another uh, advantage, and that is that the defense of the Baltic region will become easier for NATO. Because basically, um, uh, so the vulnerability for nations like the Baltic states and Poland is going down because of Finland and Sweden mm -hmm. uh, uh, to, the, to their north and northeast. So uh, I think in many ways it is good news. Uh, it is, a, it is uh, uh, contrary to what Putin wanted. He wanted less NATO. He gets mm -hmm. more NATO. Yeah. He wanted a uh, less united NATO. He has a more united NATO. So I, in many ways he made a strategic mistake uh, not, not uh, with terrible consequences for Ukraine, mm -hmm. but I think in terms of our alliance, it has strengthened uh, uh, the alliance in, in a way that nobody basically uh, foresaw. Absolutely. And um, moving away from Europe and Ukraine for the moment, um, how do you think that NATO should be responding to Russia and China to a lesser extent's interest in the Arctic? The Arctic is, uh, has always been an important area for, for NATO. But again, with the accession of Finland and Sweden, seven out of the eight uh, nations in the Arctic Council mm -hmm. are NATO members. Yes. So uh, we are better placed, so to say, to, uh, to respond to threats from the high north. Mm -hmm. uh, and if climate change uh, increasingly will lead to an opening of the northern route, mm -hmm. there's a, a, another threat access, so to say, from the north uh, uh, that can be used by Russia in practical terms and theoretically also by China. But uh, uh, that means that we also uh, already have our p uh, regional plans focusing on the high north as well. Yeah. So we are looking at this. We are making sure together with the, the nations that are close to the high north that we have the right capabilities, that we have the plans in place to actually do what is necessary to protect us uh, in, in that region as well. And finally, how much attention do you think NATO should be paying in the Indo-Pacific as we head into the future? Yeah, so NATO will remain a regional alliance, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it's it's uh, it's it's not likely that uh, nations from the Indo-Pacific will become a member. Yes. Uh, so that is not uh, what we're talking about. Uh, so we're not looking to enlargement to the Far East, mm -hmm. uh, as you sometimes even hear. That is not the situation. But what we see with uh, the security problems in the world, uh, security problems are global. Mm -hmm. So the consequences of what happens in Ukraine is also felt in the, uh, the Far East, in the Indo-Pacific. And therefore, they are helping Ukraine. Yes. They are helping Ukraine as well with financial help, with weapons and, uh, and, and, uh, and non-lethal aid. So it's 50 nations that help Ukraine, not only NATO mm -hmm. nations. And so the, the consequences of instability and insecurity is felt globally. It has almost immediately global consequences. Mm. Therefore, we talk to uh, the Asia-Pacific partners, Australia, New Zealand, Japan and South Korea, and they want to talk to us mm -hmm. because what happens in Ukraine can happen in their region as well. Yeah. And then they, they want to have the contact with us. We don't have plans against China, military plans, because mm -hmm. China is not seen as a threat, but as a challenge. Um, and, and we will have to look uh, what it means for our region if China would become more active. But for now, that is not, uh, militarily, that's not the case. Um, but it, the, the discussions with the Asia-Pacific nations especially is about how we cooperate in general terms, uh, how we uh, learn from each other, how we can help each other, uh, both on the political and the military uh, levels. Very interesting. Thank you so much for your time, Admiral. Okay. Thank Pleasure. You.